Water power swallowing, water bottle, don't bother with it. Politicians, politics flowing like it's bottomless. Started it and finished it, water needed to swim in it. More valuable than oil, be careful, homie, you spilling it. Welcome, 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 beloved community. I know you've missed us for a while, but we are back with our relaunch of the Water Wednesdays webcast by the People's Water Board Coalition. And we're so glad that you're tuning in. Today, we are going to just learn a little bit about um, us as hosts, who being me, myself, Nicole Hill, and Valerie Jean Blakely, my beloved co-host. We can't forget our behind-the-scenes tech person, Miss Angelica, who does an awesome job. And it's a short show, so we're going to jump right into it and hear a little bit about how Valerie Jean came into this work and what impacts it had on her family. Thanks, Nicole. I'm so excited to be um, here relaunching our show. It's uh, so important uh, to us to be able to share uh, people's stories in such a beautiful way. Um, and so we're really, really grateful for all of our viewers and all of our guests throughout the years. Um, you know, we wanted we wanted to start with this show to kind of so you everybody knew who we were um, and kind of tell people our stories. So uh, both of us are impacted water warriors, and it's um, and it's important that people know that. Uh, so I got started in uh, 2011. During Occupy, I learned about um, tar sands and the Marathon Refinery and how it was just um, devastating the community there um, at the Marathon Refinery and and how tar sands was so bad for the water. And that's kind of how I got, it, you know, really started in this was learning about the human impact and the impact to water that uh, tar sands and um, and other forms of uh petroleum going through pipelines. Um, it, after, and it was, Occupy happened right after the largest inland oil spill in Michigan. It happened in Michigan, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Over a million gallons of tar sand spilled into the Kalamazoo River. And after that, I was, you know, I, I didn't know what I could do at first. And Occupy really taught me how I could organize and get on the ground, meet people and and organize together. So that was um, kind of my first uh, chance at organizing and learning. Um, and people really brought me in and gave me an education on how to do that. I'm so always forever grateful for that. Um, and then when it came uh, to uh, the mass water shutoffs that happened in 2014, we had I we were we had already couldn't make our ends meet in 2013 and 2014, the winter of 2013, 2014 because um, we were going through a polar vortex and the only thing that got paid was the electric bill, right? Like the, mm -hmm. it was a really, really bad winter. So we couldn't make our ends meet. Our water bill was kind of suffering because of it. And we learned in uh, at the beginning of 2014 that they were going to do mass water shutoffs, that a lot of people were having that same exact problem. Um, it was... And we organized for those months to stop it. We, uh, thousands of people in the street, um, organized a day or, uh, weekly demonstrations at the water department, all of those things to try to stop it. But it really hit my neighborhood in, uh, in July, July 7th of, uh, 2014. And I was, we knew that we were in jeopardy of getting our, getting our water shut off. Like I said, we couldn't make our ends meet. So it was early in the morning, um, and I heard a truck pull up outside. I saw that it was a big red Homrick truck. It said Detroit Water Collections Project on the side. Water collections, you're shutting off people's water. Let's call it what it is, right? Um, and they were going to shut my water off. So I just grabbed my phone and my camera and I went and stood, I went outside and stood over my water access line. I got kids in the house. You can't shut me off. There's no way, you know, like you can do this. And the guy didn't argue with me at all. He was uh, the men, the two men that were there. They didn't argue with me at all. They were like, okay. And then they systematically moved across the street to my neighbor's house and one by one shut off all of my neighbors. And all, of, all in all, it was three whole blocks. Um, we immediately set up uh, 
I started knocking on people's doors. People started coming here so that we could organize my neighbors and find out exactly what they needed because everybody had their water shut off except for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then we set up a water station in my front yard. People came from all over, uh, all over Michigan, Ohio. People came from everywhere. Flint, so this was before what had happened in Flint. They came and they dropped water off in my front yard. And we, throughout those few weeks, set up water stations throughout the whole city because whole neighborhoods, not just mine, were being shut off throughout the whole city. Um, we decided to fight back and organize. We organized a very large march in my neighborhood um, where we, uh, it was in the evening where we shut down Woodward uh, so that uh, we literally, hundreds of people showed up. We shut down Woodward and we went to, we marched to a community meeting where we talked about what we were going to do to stop this from ever happening again. Like it's just, it was just so egregious and people were harmed so terribly. Um, and so it was kind of through that work where I joined the People's Water Board officially um, and ended up doing this work. Like this, this became my life's work because of that. Um, I just knew that I was going to do this for the rest of my life until it was resolved. If we move forward today, we've got a water affordability plan that wasn't perfect in the beginning, but we definitely um, fought to make it a lot better. They did make the Lifeline plan a lot better because of the community advocacy and work that was being done by the People's Water Board Coalition and other advocates. Um, so it was, we did end up winning, like getting it. It's not perfect yet. We're working on statewide okay. water affordability legislation right now um, that would save lives and it would change lives and make people's lives better. So that's kind of how I got into this work and why, and the stuff that I'm doing now. And um, I feel really grateful for the community that we've built along the way. It really has created family for us, for all of us. Um, uh, it, we call ourselves water protectors. And it turns out that's a really special community to be a part of, right? Yeah. Um, so, Nicole, you have, I, I have a hard time listening to your story. I always cry when, when you tell it, but I, don't, I want you to tell it. I want people to know what happened to your family. Um, how you ended up being a water warrior yourself and, you know, uh, not just what happened, but what, you know, what you do today, still to this day and why you do the work. So I'm going to, it's short, it's a short show and I know you got a lot to talk about. So let's, yeah. let's jump right in. Let's talk about what happened to you. Um, well, um, I initially came up here back up here in 2005 from hurricane Katrina and that was devastating enough at that time i think i had my then three youngest children um i hadn't had my youngest child yet because she wasn't born until 06 so um just going through katrina my two youngest uh developed aquaphobia so if it even started raining, they would go into like panic attacks. Um, so they were actually afraid of water, which is a very ironic considering the work that I ended up doing. But I also understood that when you see um, water in its natural state and that much of it, and you don't understand how devastating and powerful water can be at the same time being at that nurturer that we all need. It's, it can be a little overwhelming. Um, so when we got up here, my kids were going to therapy. I had my youngest child eventually, like I said, in 06. And we were doing good, rebuilding our lives. And then um, in 2014, I started hearing about the massive shutoffs going on across the city and about the city's bankruptcy. And, um, we always had like water issues in the area that I lived in. But in May of 2014, I got up one morning, fixed my kids breakfast, walked them to school. And literally by the time I got back to the house, my water had been cut off and none of my neighbors had saw anything because they weren't using water department vehicles. So, um, I, when my water was cut off, I immediately went to the resources that I knew about, which was MDHHS, 
Um, I had picked my youngest daughter up from school because she was in, um, she had a half a day because she's in the lower grade. And um, I went to MDHHS and they tried to talk to the water department. The water department refused to take any type of payment because they said my bill was too large. And I had been working to try to figure out what was going on when I started noticing a large bill and they offered me no assistance in trying to even figure out why my bill was that large. Um, they just wanted to tell me it was actual water usage. And so um, I went to the office. They told me they're there since there was nothing they could do. They had to, to inform me that not having water was root grounds for removal of your children from your home. So I just got up and I walked out of the office. I didn't know what to do. I was at a loss, really, of what I wanted to do. But the one thing that I knew is I needed to get my kids out of my house. And so I had my kids stay with a um, a relative that lived uh, not reasonably close, but not super far away from me. And then my son went and stayed with a neighbor around the corner who had another son they had befriended us and they went to school together. And I decided to stay at my home because as I said, I was rebuilding my life and didn't live in the best neighborhood. And I'm like, I'm not just gonna leave my house unattended and people break in. So I'm at home and it's like one o'clock in the morning, literally the day after my water got shut off. And I hear a knock on the side door and it's the Detroit police, and they have my youngest child, who was six at the time, six and a half, and they're like, is this your daughter? And my relatives standing behind the police, like, I didn't tell them anything about your water. You know, she's mouthing this to me. So I'm picking this up, and they say, well, tell your mom what you told us. And my youngest daughter, Kaylani, who's become a water warrior in her own right, is telling me, like, I just want to be at home with you. Not understanding that she can't be. And the police are like, just, you know, no matter what you're going through, again, not knowing what I'm going through, uh, you know, just let your kid, your kids are stronger than you think they are. And I'm thinking, like, if you only knew that I had no water, you would just walk away You'd with my child it. right now. Yeah. You'd be taking you know, it. and so she came back home. And the thing is, is like what she did was waited till my my relative um, went to bed and got a chair, unlocked the deadbolt, and literally was walking down West Seven Mile by herself at like one something in the morning. Walked up to a complete stranger. It was like, "This is my address. Can you take me home to my mom?" And the, luckily, it was a a good Samaritan. But he freaked out because he's thinking, like, this someone kid kidnapped this kid and she escaped or what's going on. Yeah. And he flagged down a police car. So then home. now I'm back in my home with my kids in my home. And, of course, the other two are like, well, if she comes home, we want to come home, too. So now I'm back in the predicament that I'm trying to prevent, which is having my kids in my home. And Nicole, so I how got long involved. was your water shut off? Yeah, with my water you- off. How long? And so I got involved with Michigan Welfare Rights and through them, the People's Water Board Coalition, and started trying to figure out what I could do to get my water on. It started off as a very personal journey. And then I started looking around and seeing that I wasn't the only one this was happening to. And a lot of people, I realized immediately that were not telling their story and we're not being heard as directly impacted people because they have this fear of having their children removed. And then there's this stigmatization and this shame that society and our very our fellow community puts upon us like, oh, they couldn't pay their water bill, you know, not knowing what, what's going on, just assuming this distorted narrative that people don't pay their bills. And so I was determined to try to work to change that narrative, not just for myself, but for other people. So I started telling my story. I got involved in activism work. And I'm not going to lie, I faced a lot of backlash from it. 
I've had some people say some devastatingly horrendous things to me or about me and my family. Like if we want water, we want we should we want free water. We should go to the river. That we should be thrown in the Detroit River. You know, um, just all kinds of things. Like someone even made a comment about my weight and said, "Well, maybe if she lost weight, she wouldn't need as much water." Yeah, you I mean know? that's the situation, so, right? Mass water shutoffs. They, yeah, they affect the family so devastatingly. But then when somebody has the the courage to come and tell their story, then they're drugged through the mud from the media. Yeah. And you were definitely dragged through the mud. A couple times, yeah. So the the mass water shutoffs created, like, for everyone, not just you and me, everybody that went through it, so much shame, so much stress, stuff that yes. is not anything that people get over right away. There's mental instability, mental insecurity stuff that happens with the children, the parents, everyone, all the way yeah. around. It's a public health crisis when water it is shut off. It definitely is. I was just going to touch on that because, like, the first time my water got shut off in May of 2014, it was off for eight weeks. And um, activists at that time that were helping me worked with the water department and the deputy director, who was then Daryl Latimer, and got my water restored, which he set me up for a recipe for disaster. Oh, I got um, stories just, about homie, I'm telling you. Quickly, what he person. did was yeah. he told me, he asked me how much was I able to pay a month. Um, I told him what I was able to pay and he said, okay, what he didn't let me know is that was supposed to be an addition to, to my water bill every yeah. month. So basically he tried to set me up for the rap program yeah. and when I was not able to maintain it in October of 2014, they shut my water off again yeah. and I was so shamed yeah. and so humiliated and so mistreated. From yeah. when it was shut off in in May, that it took me like two and a half weeks to even tell the activist community that my order was off again. Yeah, and um, because of that, it was right around when the United Nations came here. I um, I ended up with uh bacterial pneumonia, and I spent like a week in the hospital, yeah. and my water was off that week, and. Beloved activists in the community that I am now a part of um, had two fairy godmothers that went down there and were like, we're getting on her on some kind of plan and you're not going to cut her water off because we cannot let her go back to this house. Yeah, without it. And she's sick. And, and that's the situation no for so many people. That was the situation for so many people. It was. It's why and, we needed you know, it. It's I why we fought all these years, right? For the water yeah. affordability plan. We we had it. We, we had and, to do and, it. And we they've been fighting longer yeah, even than longer. the massive shut off campaign <clears throat> yeah, to get a 20, water affordability plan at the city level and it was just being, you know, yeah. blocked at every entrance that could have brought it in. Yeah. There was always well, we yeah, you could get it, but so then when these bills were developed and brought into at the state level it became an entirely different fight. Yep. And we started gaining more momentum, I really believe, because it was at the state level. And we started finding out that it's not just Detroit, like the distorted narrative says. There are communities from the top of Michigan to the upper, up in the Upper Peninsula, down to, you know, the borders of other states. It's the right. entire... I'm so glad States. you mentioned that because we've got Sylvia Orduño and we're, I'm going to wrap us up, but we've got Sylvia Orduño and Senator Stephanie Chain on yes. next week to talk about the statewide water affordability legislation. It's going to be a great show. Everybody, uh, please, thank you for um, always going on this uh, journey with me, Nicole. I appreciate Absolutely. you so much and the work that you do and how much you enrich my life and make my life better. I love you. The um and thank you to all of our viewers that have been watching throughout the years. Please share this show out. Um, we're happy to come to you every week and be able to share other people's stories. And we are thank you thankful for all of the support. Try to take Absolutely. care of each other, my friends. Try to look out for each other and try to stay afloat. We'll see you next week.
Bye. See you next week. Bye. Started in infinity, water needed to swim in it, more valuable than oil. Be careful, homie, you spilling it.